Uh, it was the first time in my young life that I truly, Samoa, truly believed something that no 14-year-old should have to ever go through. And, and that is, I'm about to die. And I truly believed I was going to die. I, I thought this was our moment. Uh, so today I'd like to welcome someone very, very special who I've been working with for about the last four months. And today you're going to meet Matt Imsch. And I know some of you have already seen and heard about his encounter, but today for the first time you're going to be actually seeing what Matt saw. So without further ado, here is Matt Imsch. Hello, Matt, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. It's such an honor and a pleasure to have been working with you. Thank you so much for trusting me and for being here. I, I feel exactly the same. You and I have gone extremely close over the past what, almost a year now. Mm -hmm. And I feel the same about you. And, and um, you know, I, I really mean this. And this is not just for the video or anything. You are truly one of those souls that when my mother talked about her mother that she was proof that there are angels walking on earth i truly feel you're one of those people and i mean that from the bottom of my heart you are sweetest most special human beings i have ever had the honor to call friends so as well to you and um it's been a, it's been really um cathartic and, and uh, helpful to me in some ways. And I, I'm, I'm happy that, you know, we've been working so hard and diligently to, to get this just right. And, and you know, um, I, I just can't wait for everybody to see what, what you've done in, in the graphical terms. Thank you. And I know it's been hard too sometimes to see this thing again. Cause I, yeah, it, it, yeah, some it has. Of, yeah, the reactions like that. You had a reaction once I sent you a, a, an image and you literally dropped your cup of coffee. Yeah, I, I um, you know, some people I, I think that they with good reason look at the videos that are, are done in our, our genre and niche, so to speak. And, you know, at the end of the day all of these channels are are entertainment for people so that they enjoy them hopefully and and they get something at least at the very least entertainment out of them but you know people like you and i hope that they're going to get some education and understanding about things that are out there that most have no idea yeah. and most don't believe that um but yeah i've i've definitely I, I've done a lot of interviews over the last two years. And there's never been one that I've done that, that hasn't affected me, you know, negatively in some ways or brought me back there, made me nervous, start to, you know, shake or, or sweat, which is the norms that I do when I get nervous. And, yeah. uh, you know, this one, like I said, has been, very cathartic and, and helpful to me to, to move on to bring to life as close to possible uh, what what me and my friends saw all those years ago. So um, I'm very appreciative of it. And, you know, no matter what, if I'm telling it to one family member for the 10th time, or someone new, or like, you know, right here, I'm telling it to a number of people who may not even have any idea who I am. Um, I, I go back there every time I tell this. And, and um, I think that's why it's been so unprecedented that there is roughly a 99 percentile um, rating of people that believe me versus not to believe me and you know that one percent you always get people that won't even watch videos or whatever they just are trolls or just want to be that one that something ignorant and i and i'm okay with that I, you know i always say 
I don't begrudge anyone if you don't believe me. I I really don't. I don't hate you or or don't you know, I don't you know not like you. I don't dislike you. It's just I actually for the most part feel pity for people that don't have the ability to to open their minds enough to be able to wrap it around um you know, these subjects and, and at least look at it objectively and say, well, you know what, you, you hear about what the government or NASA or scientists all over the world discuss and they say the known universe, which I don't like hearing because let's be honest, even if we have uh, other intelligent beings, which we do, that have been around for millennia upon millennia before our young planet was born, they themselves don't really know what's all out there because, you know, as I've said in other videos before, I always picture a creator grabbing, pulling, stretching in every direction, our universe, our unknown universe. And, you know, you always hear it being said, it's growing every day exponentially. And it's just crazy to think about, you know, how vast it can be and how big and, then you take into consideration things like parallel universes or worlds, or you look at Marvel movies and DC movies and they talk about the multiverse. And I've heard many, you know, um, uh, scientists and, and specialists out there talk about that. That's true, that there really are these multiverses and same kind of earth, but, you know, right next to us down the line yeah. out of, brilliance of them and there's just a little change here and there and um i i believe on all of that i think there is so much going on that it is incapable for the human mind to grasp and understand really how big and incredible it is and you know i just want to say real quick there is in my opinion a god a, a, a one creator who is created everything and i truly believe for every soul in in this universe and other dimensions and any existence anywhere that there is in their minds a a way that their god or their their creator looks and i think even here on earth because so many follow you know catholicism and being christians and protestants and all the other you know types of religion and everyone has a little twist but for the most part you have a lot of similarities of what you know people think god may look like I don't think any of those are right. I think that out of all the just quintillions of just unbelievable numbers of intelligent beings in the cosmos, even here on Earth, two Catholics sitting in church, they both have their own thought in their mind about little specifics that are different than the person next to them, how their God looks or is or acts. And I think for every one of us, God or the creator is exactly what we think. And that's something like to really try and wrap your head around along with something that's been sticking with me since as far as I can remember. And my father, his name was Kenneth H. Emsch, and he used to throw like things to think about in us. And he said, think about this for me, Sa. And my nickname, um, one of them is Sa Sa. And he said, Sa, well, you know, think about this one. Can you wrap your head around and give me a reason how you could think that the that God or the creator in whatever form or fashion he, she, it is, has always been here? Try and really reason that in your mind and, and figure out. That I just don't think we just have the ability to realize that, that something like that could have always been just been how is that possible and i believe it and i think someday when our time comes and obviously longer than what you know most of us hope for and um, i think we'll know when that time comes and uh, it's just a really wild crazy uh, paranormal and supernatural exciting planet that we live on and um, that's what has brought me to you and i'm glad that we've been working together for what we're going to get into thank you me too so 
jumping right in. Back in 1987, you and your friends came into contact with something. We did. Um, so, as you just said, the year was 1987. Uh, I just got out of grade school. Um, I went to St. Edward's Junior High in Youngstown, Ohio, and it was a Catholic school, obviously. My parents uh, sent all five of their children to Catholic school, and I went to St. Ed's from preschool all the way through eighth. And it just so happened to be a feeder school for the high school that I went to, which was also a Catholic or a private school. And it's called Ursuline, Youngstown, Ursuline um, High School of the Fighting Irish was the the, the mascot. And uh, it is actually considered either the top 12th or 13th private school in America. So its standards are very, very high. And that's just academically speaking, you know, that's not uh, speaking about the absolutely incredible athletics that they have. But you better believe you, me, that if you're not making your grades, you're not going to be playing. Yeah. So you always had that stress. And that's good that that's like that you hear that there's a lot of high schools across America that, you know, well, his, his, it doesn't matter. It just get him eligible to play this week. We need him or we're not going to win. And, you know, most of the time you know, teachers wouldn't agree to something like that. But when you're at a school like that and they're used to that and the huge deep pockets and all of that, um, you know, you, you make that comment and, and, it's dealt with in whatever form of fashion. And at Ursuline, you did have to work to get your grades. No one carried for you. Nobody just gave you a passing grade for sitting and doodling or anything. So you were a student athlete, first and foremost, and you had to work your butt off getting ready for the, the whatever uh, sports season you had. I mean, there's been multiple state championships in football, basketball, baseball, and some other things. And uh, some of the greatest athletes in, in football have come out of uh, Youngstown, know, Ohio, especially a lot of coaches. And um, that was a big part of, you know, me and getting to that point at the next school year. That's where I wanted to go. And my dad had played there and that was important for me to live up to his stand. Um, so that got kind of put in the jeopardy a few times when this night happened. And so what happened was four of my good friends had got on our bikes, which we took everywhere when i say everywhere i mean everywhere we would we would ride our bikes hours away from home we would be in suburbs that uh you know you would normally have to take cars we ended up in in like the lake milton area numerous times and uh, we started trying to find certain places we enjoyed more than other and uh this one area uh and I, I believe I sent you the pictures. If not, I'll send you them. That, that we went to this area that had um, no concrete steps leading up to the outside patio that would take you into this huge cavernous building that was four floors. You could walk into the middle of the four uh, in the middle of the first floor, and you could look up. And you could see the other floors and, you know, we wanted to have fires at night because, you know, sometimes you just want to keep things away or just have a fire. So there was no shortage of, of supplies for fires and we led a pretty good one that night. And um, then not long after that, uh, we heard what grabbed our attention immediately was not one not two not even three dogs we heard a literal pack of these dogs run by our building and, um, you know they didn't even pay attention to us they ran past our building and made a sharp left they ran over the railroad tracks and past the railroad tracks was coke material used in, in smelting steel and things like that. And um, 
they went over to the other side and we couldn't see and we were just like okay so you know there goes our fun we're not going to get to watch this but then what happened was um i apologize about my nose uh we had two two dogs get thrown like somebody had grabbed them and through a path with these dogs. And when they came flying over this hill, it was very easy to see. Um, one of them, uh, their, their body was turned upside down. So their feet were in the air. The head was at the back and the feet were in the front and they were not happy. Um, because they hit the ground and immediately yelped and got up and limped away. And that was the first one. And the second one that this occurred to uh, not only hit the top of this mound of this coke material that's used in the smelting process. Uh, and it flew everywhere. But what really what made this rememberable is when the dog hit the ground and got up we immediately noticed blood all over the ground and, and trails of it from when it was thrown and we had figured out that whatever was over there um, had somehow some way either with a knife or some sharp instrument the nails or whatever had injured this this animal and basically cut it real bad from the front legs near the rib cage all the way down to the back legs. And I remember, you know, we're kind of starting to get freaked out here, but all I could worry about was this poor dog because I'm a huge animal lover. I've had dogs my whole life. And, um, you know, I just wanted to make a stink about it. And I remember, uh, that after this dog ran away, it yelped and limped away. And this wolf dog looking gigantic creature who had climbed up to the top of the mound and was watching them run away very intently. And just when they were about to go out of sight, it lifted its left leg and it did its business. Now, some people are you know, pieces again of, of this material start flying everywhere. And then well, again, we knew it was a boy. And uh, I started getting really nervous because I'm like, wow, if this thing is going number one and it's shooting this stuff all over, I don't want it, it seeing us. And it hadn't yet. Well, I wasn't the only one freaked out. He was also freaked out enough that they took a couple steps back and tripped and fell into our major wall, uh, was my one buddy. And, and immediately I knew it was supernatural. I mean that. I'm not over-exaggerating. I'm being 100% serious. This was the largest creature I have ever seen to date. It was in the shape of a mixture of a wolf and... Um, and a German shepherd and, and a big cat in some ways. It, it just was a combination of things. And it was huge. It was just, it was just humongous. I, I, fi I find it hard to grasp the word that can really explain it. And I wish I would have had a camera phone back then, but we didn't have them back then. So this was our, our camera phone. And, uh, we were all really scared, but when my friend hit that that makeshift wall that we had made, uh, because uh, the north, south, east, and west walls on the first floor, those walls were not there. They were just open. So you could uh, just jump up and come in from any part of those open walls. So there was a ton of these. I call them gladiator shields. They were they were big and they were curved where they curved like this towards the person. So I would assume to protect the shoulders and things like that when they hide behind. And we had no idea what these were for. So we just say, you know what, let's use these to make this makeshift wall. And we did. And we had to help each other put a second row up and down and uh, we did it on all the sides, but when we got to a couple sides, we were, uh, you know, being asked for help to do it as well, and we did. And 
this thing turned to us and the very first thing that, that we noticed is one of the things that I dream about occasionally and and it's its eyes. And and even though it was on this pile of coke, and this pile of coke was probably 15 to 20 feet high, the light from above that makeshift wall that we made, you know, that was only probably eight feet high. So the rest of it was open. And, um, you know, it was shining light outside onto the top of this hill just by accident. And uh, you got to see a little bit of this thing. And, and just when we're starting to study it a little bit, you know, it had, I don't want to say man proportions. The proportions were too big to be a man. It had men size or bigger. It had very muscular arms and shoulders and lats. And even on the scapula, you know, on its back, when a cat, big cat walks and, you know, they pop up when they walk. Even those had muscles surrounding them that would flex when it walked. And, um, so this thing decides to go from two legs or four legs to two which just blew our mind. So number one, we're looking at something that might be an escaped, you know, zoo animal or experimental animal. We had no idea to think what it was. And it had stood up on two legs and it immediately looked at all of us and the look made us nervous as well. And um, it then growled, flashed, roared at us in a way that I have since never heard anything of the like yeah. and we immediately felt it hit us if i felt it hit me and it went through me and i got sick right away and i kind of bent over because i felt like my heart was uh, affected by that well some of my other friends later had said that they felt the same thing they believed that there was infrasound utilized on us as prey that stuns the prey and gives an opportunity for whatever threw it to get on it and take care of business right. so it took a couple steps off of this pile of coke and within two steps it had all but cleared the you know, 25 feet between us and it. In two steps, it was halfway to us. The legs were so long, and then there were the arms. The arms are what really freaked me out because it had such long, big arms. They went all the way down to its ankles, almost like my ankle itches. <laughs> I'm going to scratch my ankle, and it very easily could have. So as it took a, a step near us, my one friend who was closest to me and to my left who had noticed it first and also fell into the wall and then ran over there and uh, we kind of fold suit into the building and, and we're falling over each other and we're still weak in the legs and you know, I felt really weak from the thighs down to my ankles, almost like I wanted to go down on my ankles to recuperate. But I knew that, you know, something was wrong here. And my mother had warned us before we went. She said, Matt, please, please be, be vigilant, be careful. There could be things down there that you're not aware of. And, and there are. So after this thing growled and took a couple steps towards us uh, my one friend Todd who was to my to my left and he turned and went inside the building clumsily I might add <laughs> and we all we followed suit falling over each other and we started running up to the third floor and there was no rhyme or reason for us heading to the third floor we just did from the second floor up to the fourth, you could walk into the middle of each room and you had a half wall in front of you that so you wouldn't fall in. And you could look down 
you from the very top all the way down to the first floor and see if anybody's there or anything like that. Um, so we're at this half wall on the third floor, again, not knowing why we went there, but we were. And I remember I uh, heard my buddy who had seen um, the creature first. I left that part out when we were watching these wild dogs and it went over the other side and we started hearing fighting back and everything. Uh, and after it threw them and the other ones ran and yelped away and this came up to the top of that pile, my one friend um, said, that, what is that, guys? Well, you know, Oh, my God, what is that? And we all simultaneously looked and it did the same to us. But what this thing did, like I said, took a couple steps. It was right on us. And my friend that had been going pretty, pretty far in his behavior was screaming, I want to go home. Uh, you know, granted, we're, we're still basically eighth graders. We're not in high school yet. Yeah. And... Uh, I ended up finally grabbing him and I grabbed him so hard that I lifted him off the floor and his feet were dangling. And I was a big guy, you know, even back then, I, you know, I'm six foot four. And, you know, I grabbed him harder than I meant to, but the other people in the group that was there, my four friends, my three friends and me making four were all quietly yelling at him. You have to stop. You have to be quiet. Yeah. Don't you realize if you keep this up, it's going to hit and it's going to come in here and it's going to kill us. Are you going to calm yourself down? And I had asked him this three or four times. And finally, he nodded his head. Yes. And, and that's the last I heard of it from him. So this thing. Um, had caused him to pretty much go, go you know, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. And yeah. uh, we're trying to calm him down. And I finally say, you have to shut up. You you cannot do this with it outside. Will you be quiet? And finally, he, he nodded his head, yes. And, and, you know, we were just like, oh, you know, just calm down and be quiet or go over there so that it doesn't hear you. It's going to come in. And just when we finish that sentence, it's it's going to come in, boom, you hear a vibration through the floor, and you hear that telltale sign of nails on concrete. And it was climbing itself up into the building that we were in. And then real fear started to set in. I, I was worried that maybe it was out there and there was a possibility that it could come in, but it came in, and, and you know, as I said before, we had a really big fire going in the center of this room and there was no roof all the way up to the fourth floor. So we could have big bonfires and not worry about, you know, anything catching fire. And so when this thing entered the building, first of all, we all froze right where we were. We, you know, we have been talking about, should we go to the, you know, this place over here or that place over there and it just was like no we're not going anywhere and it came in and it was so long and large it honestly looked fake and truly did um when it when it came in matt was it when it got up to the first floor that's where the fire was yes so when you enter the building which was you know, if, if you were outside in front of the building before you would hop up to this concrete outcropping, the stairs, as I said, for misuse or non-use had fallen away and crumbled over time. And underneath the only thing, you know, there was um, just an empty space in the back that something could easily be sitting down there watching and waiting. And that made us nervous as well. But um was it this thing, was it on all fours when it when it came up to the first floor? Was it on back on all fours or was it on two legs? No, well, it had gone for, through two when it stood up outside and growled at us. Yeah. But when it came back in the building, it was definitely down on all fours. Was it circling the room or circling the fire? What was it doing? 
Yeah, so first when it walked in, you could tell right away it sniffed the air. It was sniffing the air occasionally, and it was also drooling, which caused immense more stress and pressure because, number one, was it drooling because it was going to eat? Right. Number two, was it drooling because it was going to kill? So that's something we were very worried about and, and very nervous. And my one buddy who had seen it first, and he's running in circles behind us, you know, screaming, we have to get out of here. And, um, you know, my other friend was ready to try and run and get out of there. But, you know, going back down the staircase that we took, you would have, you know, ran right into this being. And then outside there was a fire escape, but the only caveat like i said very very human like in some ways so it had a it had an animal dog wolf face mm -hmm. um it had almost like a smaller tighter mane around its neck and it wasn't bushy at all it had very thin hair and we are getting a look at it and again you could see standing up definitely a boy um and it was just massive. It had the dog-shaped legs. It had a huge tail that the tail reminded me of a cougar or a panther uh, moving all the time. You always notice it moving. And it was so thick. I mean, it was like that thick. Wow. And it was also almost like it was groomed. The hair on it was super tight and no, like, long hairs or anything. So... Again, when we went inside, we made our way up to the third floor, which we had to cross from the first to the second. These stairs that had fallen away and broken away over years of misuse. And finally, when we got up, like I said, we were at this half wall and we felt at least somewhat good about our situation. There's trains going outside on and off and, um, uh, you know, somebody's got to be down here. And then, you know, if we call for help, they'll come. And it never came. Um, when this thing finally was, it was sniffing the air, trying to find us deep, very deep guttural uh, breaths. And it found us by smell. And it snapped its head up at us and it knew exactly where we were, who we were, and what we were doing there. And it almost gave a sick kind of growl smile. It was just strange. And it looked at the staircase and it looked back at us and it looked back at the staircase and back at us and then it did a... And it looked angry, Sibylla. It looked mad. It looked like we were interfering with what was going on. And then it, like it was ready to just say, screw it, I'm coming to get you. When it was on the first floor and uh, before it dropped down to run up, you know, I forgot to mention it through the infrasound and us again. And infrasound, anybody doesn't know, is, is a way for predators, elephants, um, uh, some other sea creatures, you know, like whales, I, I don't know, they they are able to use down underwater to throw their songs and be heard much further. But like predators that utilize infrasound, what it basically does is it shakes and jiggles the insides of, of prey. And it discombobulates them. And in terms of humans, you know, you get lightheaded and you feel like you're going to be sick or dry heaving. One of my friends was doing. And um, this thing, uh, when it saw that it threw this this uh, infrasound at us again, I we all agreed that this half wall that we were standing by had blocked the brunt of whatever it threw at us. And I remember having my hand on one of the, my, one of the other left or right, my hand on top of this. And I felt the vibration go through the bricks and knew that it had done it and it didn't work. And we were very thankful for that. Yeah. And, uh, 
as it started up that second row and it was getting closer to me because I would have been the first one it met. Now, like I had said before, uh, my other two best friends weren't with us at this time. They had just run up. One ran up to the roof. The other ran outside and up the fire escape to a um, an area up there on the roof where he thought he'd be safe. But there really was no safe area. And, and they heard us screaming um, at one point. Because it, it when it went back down on all fours and it started to run up, it was utilizing its tail almost like a rudder and, and, and a weight balance. Because when it hit that first set of stairs, it had hit it so fast that it was turning the whole time and, and trying not to run into the wall. And it used its tail, it threw it out to the left and curved, and that counterbalance kept it from falling over towards one side or the other. And it made it up to the third flight of stairs. It started coming up, and it got to that area where there was the three missing stairs. And it jumped over those like, you know, it wasn't even there. And it had done the same thing to the three or four missing stairs on the first staircase. It didn't even think about those. It just basically stepped over them. And uh, mm. it was it was very disturbing to see how fast it made it up. And it was almost like. It was almost like liquid metal. It was it was beautiful, actually, the way it moved. At the same time, being horrified, this thing is coming after. It had run up the stairs from the first to the second in the blink of an eye. Yeah. It turned to come up from the second to the third. And just to let everybody know, once it would have got up to the third floor, the first person it would have met would have been me. Truly, I would be because the other two ran for their lives. They one ran up to the fourth floor out this short uh, staircase that would take him to the roof. The other ran outside to the fire escape and you could hear his feet on the metal. You know, and I got scared and I actually thought about this numerous times. Like, you're so lucky that didn't break away and you fell to your doom right. because it was a breaking apart and falling off and my buddy my best friend was to my right and I looked at him and he was he was just stunned and, and, and in silence just white as a ghost and didn't know what to do and I didn't either and, and what what happened next was I saw how fast it was coming and it was looking at us the whole time I, I felt it look at me on the way up Um, it was the first time in my young life that I truly, Sabella, truly believed something that no 14-year-old should have to ever go through. And, and that is, I'm about to die. And I truly believed I was going to die. I, I thought this was our moment. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I thought that, you know, um, I thought I was going to see my family again. I thought I was going to see my parents. Um, you know, I have five siblings in my family and, you know, we don't always all get along. And I thought of them all and then I thought about my dog. Uh and I, I thought I wasn't going to play football. And this isn't happening slow like this. You know, I wasn't sitting there like, um, oh. you know, this is, yeah. you know, and it wasn't my life flashing before my eyes. It was just memories of what's coming quick. And I thought I'm not going to get to go to play where my dad played in football. And that meant the world to me. And I'm not going to see him again. And my dad and I had a very close relationship. I called him my, he was my best buddy. And, and I, I wasn't going to get to see him. Yeah. I, I was in shock and I was horrified. And I thought if it didn't take me, I was going to watch it take my friends in front of me. And, and then whoever saw it on the third person would be the last. 
and nobody would hear you scream back there and, and down there. And if they did, they would know where to look. So this thing hit the middle of the sixth uh, or the, the third to the fourth floor staircase. And it was in jumping distance from me and it could have easily just take a little leap and it would have been right on me and uh i, I truly believe there was divine intervention I, i've had angels looking over for me for a long time and this was one of the times yeah and it stopped in the middle of that staircase for a reason because all of a sudden a train came by that building and it laid on its horn and it now be it I, I believe that there was divine intervention I, I really believe it to this day and I, I felt almost like a strong presence that was saying to me you're not alone and, and I'm here and wow. uh it stopped and it looked and, and like I said before and it stopped and it looked and it looked back and it looked back again and it did it like a double triple take and it was like oh, I want them but I, I gotta go and then one last time it looked at us and it really gave me a, a look and it turned and it jetted and it flew down those stairs so fast Sabilla, that it was ungodly fast and it got from that second that third floor or was almost at the top down to the second floor in the blink of an eye and then it hit the other staircase and what was weird is and then again everybody it's up to you what you believe i don't begrudge you if you don't believe me but i'm telling you some important content that's real and it started to at first, I thought it was just my eyes. I thought maybe I was going to pass out and I was seeing like stars and black and stuff. But this thing ended up, and I swear to you, it ended up losing some more of its form and turning into black, like a shadow black. A, a, a shadow so dark that they are darker than the night sky and that's what this thing looked like and it, it was still shaped somewhat like an animal but it lost a lot of the characteristics and it was almost like an unreadable form and it hit that first floor stairs down to the basement and and left and and i mean you can't even put a second it was like a half a second this thing was out of the building boom and it was gone and we know we saw it because we talked about it. And we started screaming for help for anybody. God help us. Please, somebody help us. And it was just me and my best friend. Help, help, somebody help us. They're trying to kill us. And my other two friends came down and one had a smile on his face. He thought, oh, my God, you guys did it. Yeah, let's go. And he starts helping and. Then the other one came and he was extremely disappointed and, and he knew that, you know, more than likely they were not going to come back. And that was when, you know, real true fear started to come back in because now we're in the lower levels and, and easier prey. And um, we just decided we had to get out of there and, and we were told by one friend that we have to stay here you know stick together it's better in numbers let's just stay here and, and try and forget it for the rest of the night and so the the creature had had left the building and and my friends had come down and they're screaming help with us. One had almost a half smile on his face like he had this idea that, oh, my God, somebody's coming. Or, help, help, help. And he looked positive. And then, you know, the, the train kept going. And yeah. clunk, 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 clunk. And then it gets quieter and quieter and quieter. And then all of a sudden it's gone. Yeah. And we believe that the train operator had noticed the fire and not what was going on. Yeah. 
So the fear of God sets back in and we start talking. We have to get out of here because the longer we wait, the easier it's going to be for this thing to come back in and get us. And we were up on the on the third floor for probably 45 minutes to an hour. And as we started to go down, we literally had to drag my one friend down all the way down. We finally made it to the second and were there for like an hour and then pulled him down to the first. And then we started talking about what we had to do. We had to get out of there. We cannot keep giving this thing chances. It's going to come back no matter what. And we started looking outside through cracks in this makeshift wall and looking around and every one of us were trying to see if we could see the glowing eyes and we couldn't. So finally we just said, we've got to get out of here. We have to get back to where we were and, and out. So my friend who had lost it before was losing it horrifically again. And he's just like, you can't go. We can't go. It's going to be waiting for us. It's going to kill us all. We're all going to die a horrible death. I just want to go home. Why did I come here? And we shake him and shut him up. And finally, we told him, you're just going to stay here. We'll send somebody after we find, you know, some somebody to come get you. And he blazed. He said, no, no, please don't do that. I'll, I'll, I, I, I'll hold on to you. Can I hold on to you? And he was literally choking me and my best friend, <laughs> holding our shirt. And uh, I had a red ring around my neck for three days after that, a brush burn. We had to literally force him out of the building and pull him down. As soon as we got down, everybody's shining lights underneath where we would stand and just to make sure it's not under there. And it wasn't. And we start taking off. And we were pretty much running side by side, but every time the wind blew, every time the leaves blew across, it sounded like something out there. Um, we thought this signaled the return of this this creature. Yeah. And we finally made it to the last leg, so to speak, of this trip that we would have to take to get to the blast furnace area. Glass furnace also. Anybody can Google that. Glass furnace in Old Steel Mill, Youngstown, Ohio. We'll bring it up. Mm -hmm. And you'll see rain actually right next to that building. We got out of there. And the last leg of it was this huge mountainous pile of gravel and material and all the fun kind of stuff. That, you know, you try to get up when you're a kid, but you slide back down and everybody laughs and you pitch no matter what you do, you can't get up. And that started, you know, and it started happening to all of us right away. And whereas normally we would laugh, we were laughing because we really thought this thing was going to be behind us and anybody that falls and, you know, and it's going to get you. So we are climbing this this thing slowly as well as we can. We hear the wild dogs in the distance and we start to freak out. And mm -hmm. it's a signal this thing coming back. And it didn't. Thank God. Yeah, thank God. And we're going up this hill. and We keep losing our footing. And every one of us lost it a few times. You know, we actually just were were horrified. Finally, me and my best friend made it to the top, and we started helping our other friends get up. And we ran across the street out of out of this steel mill area and over this this home uh, my boyfriend friend lived at. That was directly across the street from there. So we're sitting on the porch and we're staring across the way. And my one friend is just, he's wrapped and curled in a ball. And we, we can't get anything out of him. And, um, we're legitimately worried about him that maybe he had a complete and utter nervous breakdown. And we're all wondering what we're going to do about supporting each other and who's going to believe us. 
we're 14 year old babies, you know, no one's going to believe us. What are you doing down there? So we told uh, two of my friend's parents, including the one who's still to this day seeing a PTSD psychiatrist and counselor. And, yeah. You know, he has a lot of mental problems. And then we ended up deciding that all four of us would stand by each other's side and uh, at the coming out, if you will, to our families. And we told my parents, um, at first we told two other friends' parents and they didn't even want to hear it. They just thought it was malarkey and baloney and they didn't want to hear about it. We saw something else and you're just full of it. So then the only two families left was my dad and my cousin, um, best friend uh, his dad so we go to my best friend's dad's house and his cousin's there and then we start to tell but they were like you know I'm sorry I, I gotta go and they left they didn't really even care his dad was there and um, his dad was there and his mom was there and it was late it was probably, you know, twelve thirty one by the time we got back, and they were upset that we were so late, and we were only fourteen, and we were all really messed up, and he could see something was extremely wrong, and we all told him, and we all backed each other up on everything each one of us said. Uh, my best friend's mom all but, you know, just walked away with her head turned. She gave one of these and said, you deal with them. This is, you know, this is ridiculous. And she just went to bed. Wow. My best friend's dad, however, I'm not going to out him because he's also passed away. And he didn't give me permission to discuss his name and say, you know what, so... I'll let everybody decide for themselves you know, what position they want to give him. But he's basically one of the higher ups in the city and decides what goes on in many forms and fashions. And he signs a lot of checks. And um, he had apparently got some calls about some strange things down by that area. And, uh, I'll have to try and find. Uh, you know, I have an email or a, or a message from somebody that works security down there at one part, and they always said that they have um, experiences down there, but didn't really uh, make a difference right then. So we told him exactly what happened. He didn't disbelieve us, which was odd. And, you know, my dad got there and I was super close with him. And, and suffice to say, you know, after I told him it, it was partly, you know, you know, partly just him trying to support me. But the other part of it was just he just I don't think could really believe it. But when we first went back that night, the first set of parents that we had told was my best friend's mom and dad, who I told you she walked out of the room. Forget it. Yeah. He looked at us and he held the high position in the city. And he, first of all, yelled at us and used some very harsh uh, uh, expletives and said, if you guys ever go down there, I'll make sure that you go to JJC, including your friends. And, uh, he did, however, give us little snippets of, you know, the way he acted without exactly saying that he knew what we were talking about. Now, later in that week, my best friend cornered him and said, you know, I would never lie to you. And um, he basically told us that he had got some stuff out of him that my, my buddy's dad knew of those things being down there. And he said those things not just one and oh. that they get tons yeah tons of 
fishermen down there and there had been fishermen on and off disappearing and rum uh, uh, a couple homeless people that had made it their home uh, as well when we weren't around they disappeared and you know we just were kind of still almost excited and we said well where do you see him and he told us and um we were just looking for any validity and then, you know, going back to my dad, my dad is my best buddy. He's my best friend. Um, you know, he kept looking at me and he had had a discussion with my buddy's dad when he came to pick me up and my buddy's dad had pulled him in the kitchen and he told him, I think you can appreciate where we are with this. And, um, you can also appreciate that Matt should be starting as a freshman and when he plays football. And if you think that he is going to get a position, you know, at the school he wants, he's going to have to, you know, change some things in, in terms of like, um, You know, they just didn't, he just didn't want us talking about it. He didn't want us talking about these things because they want our school members to hear it. Somebody would go down there and get hurt horribly because I forgot to mention, you know, we'd be in these buildings, we'd make very little sound sometimes and huge bricks would fall from the ceiling or the, the machines they had up there. And um, I don't know. It was a dangerous. It was a dangerous place for y'all to be, obviously, for for multiple reasons, not just the fact that people had disappeared and died. But. Yeah, and, and, you know, we could fall through steps at any time, and I can't tell you how many times we went up very tall buildings, and there were literal holes in the ground, in the that you could see all the way down to the ground. That I gave, we would have been killed. Every parent's worst nightmare is what, what you're saying. Yeah. And it was it was very disturbing. And then fast forward again, going back to the night we're heading back uh, there. And, you know, like I had said, we'd heard those wild dogs and they never we saw them, we never saw them again. And we never saw the creature. And, um, you know, we we didn't go back down there till we were in our 20s. And uh you know, we were able to look around the room because in this room there were these gigantic concrete pillars that went from in the ground that were were made for the building to have stability at four points in all four corners. And um, when this thing stood up, on two legs and it growled at us and its teeth were huge and they came down and up and they were hanging out the mouth and um, it also again shined its eyes but it had its head back and was looking up at us with its neck all flared out in these tufts of they were only shaped like, like spades on a spade card and uh, I always remember that. And, and, you know, my dad drove me home and he kept looking at me with a scared look of, of you know, and this is one of the times that, you know, I think you're you're 100 percent telling the truth. So my dad had talked to his father and he discussed some of the things that he said he had found and then gave the impression that one of these homeless people that had been supposedly mauled by these wild packs of dogs had bite marks that were not considerate or, or similar to what one of these little dogs had. And, um, it was really scary to him and he didn't want his son to go back down there and neither did my dad and he contacted all of our parents and you know they basically were, were trying to you know get us not to be there but the next day um you know we had told everybody and uh, the only one who basically believed us at all was my my best friend's dad and he really didn't get into what he thought and um, my dad did to a point and we um 
had a lot of trouble, you know, keeping that a secret. We wanted to tell all our friends. We wanted to tell them what happened and all that. But it was so hard to get to. And <clears throat> it was just definitely, uh, you know, an experience that messed us up so much so that to this day, my one friend who uh, had the severe, most severe reaction, sees a psychiatrist a couple times a week. He has a counselor. He sees every time, you know, maybe three or four times a week. And, uh, you know, I've had issues. I've gone on antidepressants at times because I couldn't sleep because I was thinking about it. And, um, Do you think having I mean, the fact that there were the four of you and the four of you could at least speak to each other, that that helped you having having each other to talk to? Um, I apologize. It's all right. It's all right now. You know, and I, I miss my best friends. You know, they... Um, You know, two of them are no longer here. My best friend's not here anymore. And, uh, you know, they, they made some choices in their lives to start, you know, doing things to help cope with the problems. And uh, it, it led to their, their deaths. And, and uh, I'm so sorry. Thank you. And, and my other buddy, as I just said, and then for me, on top of going to some psychiatrist, I also... Uh, you know, I'm half Lebanese. I went to a, a church. It's it's a Maronite right um, Catholic church, which basically, in essence, the easy way to describe it is uh, the Maronite right is a, it's a it's a Lebanese uh, connected Catholicism. It, it's really no different than Latin uh, Catholic, but just some different things, this and that, and and. When I married my wife, Stacy, um, she was a Protestant and she wanted to marry uh, with, you know, in a family where we had one religion under the group. And uh, she decided to do that for me. And, and I also took the classes with her and I became that. You know, that that was the church, St. Mary's, of where I was going to see a different uh, priest when I was younger about it. And I went for probably a month, a month and a half and spoke to him about things and asked him if, if he maybe knew what it was. And, um, you know, he said, I'm not sure what I do for you is going to help. And, um, you know, so it's definitely resistant to, to tra traditional treatments, but, um, uh, it helped to talk about it. And, 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 you know, my priest told me that, Matthew, sometimes you have to understand that there are things out there that sometimes bleed into our existence, that veil that we have in front of us all the time. So many are unwilling to look down and around and uh, instead of just at that phone. And, uh, you know, I make a point to, to do that. And, um, it was just, it was just really disturbing. And, and to this day, you know, I still see it uh, once in a while, a, um, a counselor to help me get through it. I'm no longer on vacation, thankfully anymore, but, uh, you know, I really wish that, that my buddies that were playing with us could play again and, and maybe we could do something together, but that's a long lifetime ago. And, um, I don't even know if that had anything to do with, with the story, but. Um, well, you were so, you and your friends were so deeply impacted by what you, by what you witnessed. I mean, what happened to you? And, uh, you know, literally it's like the fabric of your reality had to have been ripped in ways I mean, could you ever see the world the same way after you saw this thing? Was that your experience? I, I did. You know, when it stood up on two legs, you know, it already was getting crazy. 
when the dogs were getting thrown over this pile of material that really snapped us like into whoa what is that but then what happened next you know was when it stood up it was just like our our minds were blown our jaws had to hit the ground and we i remember what i wondered i was wondering oh my god what is that i'm looking at a werewolf this is a werewolf what is going on I'm going to wake up because it, it it was so big and it just just was so out of place that it looked fake to me. And I said that numerous times over the year. It, it almost came off like it was fake, yeah. like it really wasn't real. And, and they all agreed with me that it looked fake. Yeah. Um, and its eyes. Can you tell us about its eyes? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. The eyes uh, were the first things that I ever saw. And then. And looked at me and they glowed and they glowed so bright that they were of an orange, amber, yellowish color. And they just were so bright when it was going through, you know, areas where there was no light and there was just, you know, walls and things like that. And would light up those walls just by turning its head and looking in those directions. It would look up in the sky and and sniff and smell. And um, it was a heck of an experience. And, and you know, I, I have a lot more support these days. and. Um, it definitely changed my life and my friends' lives lives because we realized that no matter what, we didn't live in one of those boring, um, you know, documentary style uh, lifetime. Uh, it, it just, it changed the way we looked at everything. Things that were in Fangoria magazine and you know, on TV and movies and comic books and and magazines it just this is fake um, they sure had it had it on uh, pretty right and and done a very good job with it yeah um it it it, it, it has had us all uh, up until my other two friends passed a few years ago it had us all realize there's a lot more to this world than we realize uh, the priest that I spoke to told me, Matthew, you have to understand sometimes there are things out there that are not normal, that sometimes bleed into our existence, and we see them. And when we do, sometimes we chase them and try and, and you know, find them. And they might be, a, he made a point to me, it was like, you know, did you ever think about maybe we are their ghosts like we are their you know cryptids that they see us doing things and instead of us looking the way we do now we are as shadow people or whatever and we are um, you know going around deciding if if you know things are going to be the way it's going to be and, and it just was insane Sibylla it just it just changed everything it just made us realize that if these things are real then definitely Bigfoot are real and, and all kinds of other cryptids uh, exactly. can exist out there so yeah, exactly yeah it, it, it we didn't go back till, like I said, until we were in our 20s and we looked around and kind of figured out the size of the pillar and how big we'd have to be to fill that up. And it was monstrous. It was really big and it would have made short work of any person uh, easily. Yeah. Um, did you guys yeah, the- Did you guys talk about it, like continue? Did you go to the same high school, the, the four of you? Uh, we mostly went to the same high school. The group of us that uh, went our freshman year to the high school were all together. Yeah. But unfortunately, you know, Catholic school being private and expensive, yes. um, some of my buddies couldn't afford to go there personally. And uh, so we did get split, but the, we were always immensely close through high school, and and we were always together as we grew up, not only in high school, but especially we came back together in college. And yes, it's come up many times, and we've still to this day 
tried to watch, you know, YouTube or anything like that and, and pick up on what this thing is exactly or things out there. And uh, it's never really happened. But but again, we stayed in close with each other and the subject does come up to this day. Yeah. Um, well, thank God that you weren't alone. Um that you that you know that I mean I'm sorry that this happened to you I'm sorry that this and that it happened to your friends and um, thank you but thank God that you weren't alone because I mean who would you have had then and it makes me think about all the people who are alone when they see things like this and they feel like they have no one to turn to no and you know I I want to say this is. I feel I felt blessed that I was able to see this thing uh, with my friends, and we made it out of there. So we all remember, and we're all we're together in this, me and my friend. And if anything, me speaking of what happened to me, and then as of the last, I'd say maybe year. I have been really making a point to come out and, um, you know, admit what happened and say my name and last name and where I'm from. And if you look at earlier interviews with me, you know, it only started out with just my first name. And I it took me a long time to remove, to put my last name in there and specifics. But I, I, I really don't care anymore. And I just think that, People need to realize that it's not always just, you know, hunky-dory in, in this world. And as I said, we have this veil that is constantly around us. And there are other things walking out here all the time that we have no idea we can see them. We can't. But sometimes, again, something happens that causes them to be seen. And, um, and I apologize, sweetheart. I just, you know. Well, times I, I I almost broke down and I had to stop and, and collect my thoughts and um, I'm sorry about that but it, it's just it, it's it's just something that is very serious to me and, and it freaks me out quite honestly. Yes, I'm sorry, and I do so deeply appreciate you being willing to share what happened to you here and also to you know work with me to recreate what you saw because i know that wasn't easy for you to do either no no it wasn't um and you know looking at just to let everybody know the renderings that i've seen of what you've done so far and you and i have worked pretty damn hard <laughs> um, this rendering of these this creature and what what i saw is You've done an incredible job, and, and I truly mean that. You know, I've learned a long time ago from my father, Ken, and from Jim Tressel, who was my coach at Youngstown State University, that one of the things you do not do to people because it won't help them at all is to lie to them and tell them things that you think that they want to hear. And I just don't do that. I try my best Good. to tell those who... Um, you know, deserve it that they they did well, and and what you have done bringing what I saw to life again is just it's just astronomically good, and and you are excellent at what you do, and I applaud you, and I thank you, and I thank you also for the people that that are going to come on your show and are going to do this. And, and that means so much to me that, uh, you know, finally we're getting to a point in society where people don't have to feel like, you know, if, if uh, I don't want to talk about it because I'm going to get made fun of and I'm going to take it to my grave and yes. all this and that. But if you can be brave enough to do it and just take that first step, even if it's just a little one, like I did in my first interview and just not even really say your last name or, yeah. you know, just use your first name for a while until you get a little more comfortable. And I truly believe you will. And, uh, 
you know, that would help immensely. And I would love to be a part of that. And I would love to be a part of, you know, the, the other situation. And, um, there's a lot of, a lot of good people out there who have seen things that are sitting on that experience for fear of ridicule or effect. Yes. And, it's a shame because that's not why you're doing this. You're doing this for a reason. Oh, to help. Yes, to help people and to get, get the word out there. Please don't be afraid to share because people can learn from your experience. Um, if you if you uh, had some advice to give, like say you're a parent, um, you know, if your daughter one day, you know, came to you white as a ghost and said, you know, dad. I saw this thing, you know, what kind of you, advice can you give to parents of, you know, children who have, are having these experiences? What would you tell them? Um, you know, I would just tell them to, you know, realize that, that again, that they're not alone, that, even though the fear is in you that maybe you might get, uh, you know, as you had said earlier, ridiculed or made fun of, and, and they have that horrifying fear of, you know, I'm going to be a fool or made, uh, you know, lose my job or, you know, cause let's be honest, Sibylla, I've heard stories of some people that have come out and told their experiences that have unfortunately lost their jobs. Uh, I don't want to scare anybody like that from saying that, but I truly believe that lately, as I've been hearing more and more people talking about what's happened to them and the exact circumstances, and um, you, you have to sit back sometimes and listen to some of them. Now, let's be honest. Some of them are really cringeworthy, and you can tell they're made up and they're not real. But then there's other ones who are very serious about telling it. And, and their number one fear is lose a job, lose family members, lose their home, have everyone they know think that they're crazy or anything. And, and that's not how you're going to be looked at in this day and age. Some of the people in your family or at where you work might not see things that, that you agree on or right. that you believe are, are real, but... You know, it's your prerogative. It's your decision to say, well, you know what? I do believe that some of these things are out there that go bump in the night. And um, I've actually seen things with my own eyes. And they don't have to elaborate with it. But I just say, be brave. Be true to yourself. You know, one of the things my father taught the five kids in my family when he was dying was, if you can take anything I've ever taught you, and, and remember it for me. I want you to remember to be true, honest, good souls, and, and just the best, most loyal friends that you can be to people. And when you're laying on your deathbed someday, whenever that may be, you'll be able to look up at the sky and, and say, when your time is coming, at least I know I did something right. And I was there for someone I was there for my friends. Yes. And it means. I know. It means a lot to me, you know, that I have a lot of people that, um, that have supported me over this and that aren't making fun of me. And then the majority of the people that have seen these, um, it's overwhelming the amount of people that are saying that they believe me and then uh, that they applaud me for doing this. And, and my one friend that's still here, he, you know, he is, um, he's got a very successful construction company that does international business. And, you know, I've asked him, well, you think maybe you would do this with me that you would, you know, show them that, you know, yeah, we're not, he, this is, I am that one of those guys. And he said that right now, he's like, I'm, I'm sorry, but he, he always apologizes. I'm so sorry. I'm so heartbroken. Please don't hate me. 
I just am in the middle of this, like, for instance, he just got back from Japan and he was in Japan putting together a multi-million dollar, multi-million dollar project, building a bridge and some things. And he said, do you really think with their honor system over there that if they meet somebody from the States and they talk about, you know, that they've seen Bigfoot or a dog man or something like that, do you really think these people that are putting a you know hundred million dollar contract in your hand are gonna want to mm -hmm. sign that contract with you and I had to admit and say no. Yeah. And he he is very guilty. He feels very guilty I'm doing it by myself. And he promised me that you know when he retires in the next six, seven years that he's gonna sit down right next to me and and I told him, you do that. Oh we're to every single interview that I've ever done and all of my good friends who I have love in my heart, like that are part of my family, like you. And then we're going to introduce you that this is, this is my other friend that was, you know, lucky enough to still be here. And, yeah. and he swears he's going to do it. And I told him, don't sweat it. Don't, don't lose any sleep over it. I'm doing it. And I, you know, if I don't have people that believe me, then that's on them. Yeah, uh, I've had a lot of human behavioral specialists on uh, my most recent interview on what lurks beneath. And um, if you go through the tons and tons of comments, you can find two or three of them that say, you know, I do this for a living. I went to school for this. I did my 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 thesis on this. And, and uh, you know, it's on the website and it. it um, you know, we learned to watch for human tells of lying. You know, we're human behavioral specialists. And Matt, you show zero. Well, they didn't say it in the comments that Matt Weiss, they weren't talking to me, but they said, we see zero percent of any tells or anything that we could point out that he's lying. Yeah. And then Adam Davies, I'm sure you know Adam Davies. Okay. He, he, He's in the cryptic community, and uh, him and I have been talking a lot lately, and then I had met him at Josh Turner's conference, and we hit it off there, and we became friends, and we've been staying in touch, and we've talked about my experience numerous times, and he got to see the newest interviews, and he said, you know, man, I want you to, I asked him what he thought about it, and he said, you know, man, I want you to know something that when... I was still, you know, over over across the pond. He said I was a court cross examiner, and that's my specialty, and that's what I have, you know, that's what I did in in my field. And he said you gave me zero, and you can ask him if you want. Anyone can zero percent of anything that seemed like I was faking, lying looking for things to say, umming and awing, you know. You know, yeah, I stopped a couple of times today and I lost track of what I was talking about because I, I sometimes I'm okay with it. And I'll laugh and smile through the whole thing. But then there are other times when it gets a little dark for me and I go back there. And I think maybe because I watch so much uh, stuff uh, earlier today about about this subject and things that it was just stuck in my subconscious and maybe that's why I thought about you know the negative facet of it but um, yeah it, it's just it's been a wild ride and and I don't regret that it happened I'm glad that it happened because I learned that there really are things like this out there and Someday, I hope that we'll know the, about them as much as we do about the mountain gorilla who no one knew anything about yeah. for so long. Um, we're going to have proof of some of these things someday. And, and, you know, this dog man that I saw, I truly believe it was supernatural. And uh, one of the reasons was when it was in that building and it was going around the fire and those the scapula were popping up like a big cat and there was muscle surrounding them. And um, it came by the fire. And I, I forgot to mention this anatomically speaking, 
its its upper body, its leg, its arms were so long that when it walked, it was almost at an angle because they were so much longer than the legs. And people, you know, you will actually get to see uh, a rendering that Sibylla did an absolutely incredible job of bringing the life what what we saw it's as close to an actual snapshot of this creature that we saw and uh, it's disturbing and when i see it it brings me back and i get scared and i get goosebumps but i i'm glad that we did it and that people can see it and get an idea of what these things are like and, yeah uh, it's it out of was, it's out of your head now. I mean, now it's going to be out of your head and onto, you know, onto the screen so that you can point to this and say, "Look, folks, this is not something out of my imagination, you know, or Sibylla's imagination. This is literally what I saw. This is what we saw." It is. It is. Yeah. And it excites me that people know instead of saying, "Well, what it looked like, what it looked like." Well, this is basically it. It's the next best thing from the an actual snapshot and what's good about it too is it's very close up and you could see specifics and you and i both know you're right here i mean we've got very detailed on this thing took us a long time to get where we are yes because you are so driven to make it just right well and and i I love and i struggled i struggled i struggled with it um because, well, first off, I've never seen a dog man. And second off, this creature looks one way from the front, like when it's facing you. And when it turns, its profile is not anything like what I expected. And so I really, I don't know if you remember, I really struggled with the prof- doing the profile. In fact, so much so that finally we just got on a Zoom call and we did a screen sharing um and I, you know, you helped me manipulate it because I couldn't figure out how to get it right. And so, I mean, um, Matt, we have spent like literally hours <laughs> together oh, yeah. on Zoom calls. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I love it. I love the time that we have gotten to spend together. And I deeply appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, I want to real quick finish with that, uh, some of the anatomy real quick. Again, it had the dog legs and had a long, long, thick tail that was that thick, and it looked like a panther's tail, and it used it like a rudder when it was running on the on the stairs as a counterbalance, because like when it ran up the stairs, it was turning to the right, but it brought its tail out to the left to kind of use that counterbalance, and then again, when it was walking, it did not have like paws, it had hands, it had giant giant hands and the arms went so long like i said down to its sides it could scratch its ankles with it standing up and it had these raccoon looking hands i didn't really notice claws but my other friends said they saw it and when it walked you heard them clicking on the ground and oh. the other supernatural things that happened is when it walked by the fire if anybody's seen the movie predator they see how it kind of cloaks well, the only time I saw anything that it did, and it makes you think if they can cloak, that's why they're hiding from us in the woods and we have such hard, hard trouble seeing them. Well, it set its front arm, whatever, down by the fire. And if you've ever seen on videos the sun with magnetic storms and the different kind of shapes and, and ribbons, if you will, of magnetic firestorms that come off of it, it put its its left arm down by that and immediately it started to cloak out. It was almost completely invisible. You could still kind of see it in a way, but then you could see fire going through it and bouncing off of it, the, the image. And um, it, it lifted it back up after it took a couple steps and um, it turned back to normal. And uh you know, that really, really grabbed my attention. And um, wow. it was just, it, it, again, when it left the building, it, it turned almost into like a shadow creature at the end when it left from the second to the first floor and out. It just almost still had its same shape, but it just bang and it was gone. And uh, many supernatural types of things that happened with it. And, 
Um, you know, I'm glad nothing bad happened to anybody that I was with. And, and you know, I have mixed feelings about saying that I'm glad that this happened because I'm able to share it and, and be able to give some idea and research about what these things really look like. Uh, yeah. So that for all intents and purposes, um, you know, what happened. And, and again, my one best friend's dad, you know, when he talked to him a, a week later, he basically told him that he knew what this thing was. And in the uh, some of the officers in Youngstown had told him that they had seen it before and that they had gotten calls on it before and they were having some issues. And they said they believe that at least one of the two homeless people that were mauled and killed by wild dogs was actually killed possibly by one animal, which would have been this. And, you know, I really truly believe it was coming to kill us and eat us. I really do think, and we wouldn't have been able to stop it. So I, I think that's that's basically it. Yeah. Well, Matt, thank you again so much. And um, anytime, anytime you need anything from me, you know where to find me. And, of course, I'm going to be in touch with you. And I still have some images uh, that we're working on. And, uh, you know, God bless you for being here. And I love you, my friend. I love you too, Sabella. I'm so thankful that we're friends, and and that means more to me than anything. I mean, you know, it's 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 neat that this is being made and and, and turned into you know an actual video with graphics and that. And I'm excited that people are finally going to get to see what I saw for the most part. But the thing I take away from this more than anything else is I have another family member who I truly love on this planet, and that's you. So thank you, thank you so much. I, I care your friendship, and, and I didn't ever get to meet your mom yet, but, you know, I, I truly care about her as well and tell her I said hello, and I hope she's feeling better. Oh, thank you. Good night, my friend. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody.